was reading your article, a, a kind of famous metaphor occurred to me that I don't think you mentioned in the article, but it's Wittgenstein's ladder metaphor where, you know, he says, I guess he's talking about his own argument in the Tractatus or something, but he says, this is a ladder you use to get to a point where you look down and realize that the ladder itself is flawed and you throw it away, but but it got you here. I mean, that that's kind of the way you're looking at traditional religious thought, right? It gets you, it gets you to kind of pure philosophy, but you don't want to like, ju you don't want to jump to pure philosophy. You think there's virtue in using the ladders and climbing there. Yeah, I do. I think there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity encoded in theological traditions. All of the ones I've studied, they, they, are, they record with better fidelity the actual content of experience of people that leads to serious constraints on theology. So if you just sit there and have some intellectual picture of the world and it never comes to grips with people's anxiety in the face of death or their horror at their own shortcomings and the guilt that they carry with them all the time and their inability to do what they really want to do, these very poignant aspects of the human condition, um, then, of course, what you've done is essentially become non-empirical in your theological work. The theological traditions are much better than the philosophical traditions at preserving all of that information. And that, that they do it beautifully, extremely powerfully, you know, captivating uh, even uh, to me. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for those theological traditions. And that's why I think we need always to remember where we come from as transreligious theologians and philosophers. So you're you're advocating a um, a philosophy that is, this isn't the only kind of philosophy you're advocating, but you would like to see a kind of philosophy that is very attentive to the psychological needs of people. You could call them the spiritual needs of people, I guess, but in any event, the needs that are reflected in, in religions. Yes, correct. Yep, <clears throat> suffering is a big problem for human beings and so is evil. And these things need to be built into the philosophy that we call religious naturalism or that we call trans-religious theology. Otherwise, it's just not living up to any part of its name, really. So at this point, you might get a different kind of objection from uh, philosophers. Not not that, that you're drawing on religion, but that you want to introduce the idea of a uh, of practical use of, of, of you know the you're saying we want news you can use from psycho from philosophy or they might say you're trying to turn us into a self-help discipline and we're not going to filter our inquiry with 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 that constraint in mind the constraint of whether people are going to find it inspiring or consoling i mean maybe it's a bleak meaningless universe and if it is we're going to say it yeah yeah <clears throat> and then they should and i do so uh, uh, I would really, it, with that particular objection, I would uh, fight against that very hard. I'm not interested in it being a self-help movement or a self-help discipline. Other people will do that. I'm interested in empirical adequacy. This is a form of empirical philosophy. <clears throat> if you're going to try to get people to understand the way the world is, not for their well-being, just to tell the truth, as a philosopher should, Part of that involves helping them understand the human condition. That's an essential part of it. To get that right, you need to pay attention to the relevant sources of data, and your theories need to be fully responsive to those data. Okay. Now, you say in the paper at one point that some philosophers are doing work that is, quote, virtually theological. What are examples of that? I don't know if you want to name people, but at least give us a sense of the kind of philosophical thought that is, you know, represents what you would hope is the kind of culmination of this uh, trans-religious theology. Mm. <clears throat> well, I think that it's easy to point to people in the past. I think Plato is virtually theological in my sense. I think Plotinus is. And, and what part of Plato, he, he's better known than Plot Plotinus, but what, what part of Plato is, is an example of this? His articulation of the good. So in the Republic, when he talks about the divided line and he sets up uh, sort of levels of greater and lesser intensity of being at the top of the story is the form of the good. He does not understand that in any sense anthropomorphically, uh, which suits me very well. And yet at the same time, uh, it is theologically incredibly potent. And I think he understood himself to be saying something theologically potent, though without the word, because for him, theology meant <clears throat> discussion of the gods in the polytheistic okay. Greek context. Okay, so there's an ethical dimension and the ethics is not you know, purely relativistic or nihilistic? Is that is that one way of saying it? 
Right. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That's uh, okay. The, the ethics is a complicated uh, question. Um, all, all on its own, I'm not sure how much that ball of wax you want to open up here, but let me just say uh, briefly that I'm um, an ethical pluralist. So I take the ethical affordances that show up in nature to be exploitable or realizable in a lot of different ways. Those ways can sometimes conflict. So, so I combine ethical realism, which is a kind of critical realism. It's, it's, the, ethical, it's the idea that there is such thing as ethical truth in a sense, right? That, yes, or, that ethical that, ideas are in some sense kind of out there. Yes, and that truth shows up, uh, shows up to us in the form of possibilities. But to actualize possibilities, we need to make choices. As Nietzsche said, we need to take responsibility for those choices. And that's an awesome kind of responsibility that we often find disorienting. We are not getting messages from the beyond that tell us what to do. We're using stories about the beyond to calm the pain associated with taking full responsibility for your own moral actions. When we take moral actions, we're realizing certain possibilities and foreclosing others. Mm -hmm. Other people make other choices. So moral pluralism at the same time as moral, a kind of moral realism. Okay. It'd be like a virtual moral realism. Okay, so a kind of ethical dimension is one uh, part of philosophy that can, I guess, help make it, quote, virtually theological. What about at a metaphysical level? I mean, should I be thinking of like Kant, who, as I very dimly understand him, was suggesting that there was something beneath the surface appearance of things that, uh, you know, the thing in itself or the noumena or whatever, that uh, is deeper and that we and that the human mind cannot comprehend is that is that a, a theological idea yeah it is how do you get good theological ideas as a trans-religious theologian do you go to kant or whatnot i i think the the solution there is that you need to get good at comparison you need to look at god ideas from across the philosophical and religious traditions the wisdom traditions of our planet and you need to form categories for comparing them and talking about them that distort the actual usage as little as possible. Ultimate reality was a category that was introduced by Max Weber and adopted by Paul Tillich. Um, it was an extremely important category at the time, and it's persisted because of its virtues along those lines. It mm -hmm. tends to register what's important. It's got a contact points with all religious traditions and philosophical traditions. But at the same time, it doesn't uh, distort them particularly. Mm -hmm. So it's a vague category, it's a general category, it can be specified in lots of ways. It's a category I appreciate and use to talk about what it is that's behind things, what it is that we're really trying to talk about as philosophical theologians. And in some 